The third great myth that protects uh, media power in this country is the idea that, you know, no matter what, even with concentrated markets, any way you slice it, the, the, the media system gives the people what they want. You know, this especially is true for entertainment. They don't make this argument for journalism as much. But, you know, I think I was probably, I, in my earliest stage, one of my first memories is hearing my father tell me that one too. The media system gives you what you want. You know, the, the moral of the story, the argument is, you know, so shut up. You know, if you don't like what the media system does, don't blame the system. Blame the morons who are demanding it. So if you want to change the system, change the morons. Don't change the system. The system is sort of a, you know, a dependent variable. The media bosses will gladly give you whatever you want if you demand it. And so if morons want to watch dumb shows, the media bosses will give dumb shows. Now, it makes a certain amount of sense if you think about it. I mean, television studios, movie companies, they're out to make as much money as possible. They're competitive. They clearly don't want to put out TV shows people don't want to watch. They clearly don't want to produce movies people don't want to buy tickets to watch. So uh, at a certain point, it makes perfect sense. Competitive pressures compel these firms uh, to give the people, in fact, what they want. But upon closer inspection, this argument is deeply, deeply flawed and self-serving and even circular. For one thing, for markets to give people what they want in basic economics, they have to be competitive markets. They have to be markets where if you're, if you're dissatisfied with what the choices are, new people can enter the markets to give you new choices. That's what a competitive market is. There are no barriers to entry. That's a monopolistic or oligopolistic market. Media markets, by definition, almost all of them are oligopolistic or semi-monopolistic. They're not competitive. And as economists will tell you, that means you don't have consumer sovereignty, you have producer sovereignty. They give you what you want, but within the range of what makes them the most money. And they've got a lot of control over that. They've got a lot of control over that. And then it becomes a very complex relationship because they give you what they can make the most money off of and you develop a taste for it. And then you start demanding it. I mean, it's a, it's a complex relationship. Uh, demand doesn't just create supply. To a certain extent, supply creates demand. And if you're never exposed to something, you, of course, you'll never demand it. You can't. It's a complex relationship. The best example of how this process works, and this, again, is appropriate for uh, given the being at the film school or film studies here, is with foreign films in the United States. Uh, in the early 1970s, uh, roughly, I don't know, correct me if you know the figures, Constance, 10% uh, of all films shown in American theaters were foreign language films in the early to mid-1970s, 10%. Uh, by the mid-1980s, it was down to 2 or 3 or 4%. Uh, by the late 1990s, it was down to less than one quarter of 1%. And then it fluctuates if there's one hot movie or uh, periodically, but it's basically down at rock bottom since then. Now, by the give the people what you want theory, you know, you would expect that sometime starting in the late 1970s, American people stood up en masse, slam their fist on the table and said, get those foreign films out of our movie theaters. We're not going near that theater till that foreign stuff's out of there. And give us what we want or we're not going back, right? That's what you would expect. In fact, it wasn't demand creating supply, it was supply creating demand. Because what happened was, starting in the mid-1970s, was that you saw the rise of the multiplex, the multi-screen theater, which basically drove the single-screen theaters out of business. And instead, you had in community after community, multi-screen theaters where you had one, project, uh, one projectionist could handle all the screens, one popcorn maker, one ticket person. So a single screen theater couldn't survive. So all the foreign films would come in with a network of, foreign, of theaters that service nothing but foreign films. And I sure Santa Barbara had its share. Uh, Seattle, where I lived in the 1970s, I think we had seven, eight, nine foreign language uh, theaters just in Seattle. Uh, New York City, Manhattan in 1975 had 25 theaters that showed nothing but foreign language films in Manhattan and New York City. Uh, well, all these theaters basically found it harder and harder to survive uh, cost-wise in this new multi-screen environment. And producers of foreign films when they came to the United States increasingly found they had to go to these chains to get their films shown. And the chains were it's a little different ballgame. Suddenly they had to compete with Hollywood films to get screen space. Uh, they had to guarantee to do so much TV advertising, oftentimes more than the cost of the film, to lock in a spot on the screen. Uh, and some of the films fell away, uh, gradually it just eroded and people stopped showing their films. Now, I have uh, students, I remember in the, I've had students in classes in the past years uh, when I've been talking about films and foreign films and, and they'd look at me in amazement and say, you mean they make movies in France? Because, yeah. you know, they, well, you laugh, but where would they know that? Where would they know that? Tell me where they would learn about that. And they go into the film, the video rental store, they don't, they just whiz right by that row, if there is a row, they probably don't even know what that stuff is. 
and go because you know they've never been exposed to it. The point I'm making is that culture media is a complex relationship with supply and demand. I mean, it's not a simplistic, vulgar one. And the idea that markets give the people what they want is not meant to shed light on it, but to rather disguise what's actually going on.